We're going to dive into part three of Way of the Wise. If you're ready, say, oh, yeah. Yo, I, I am so excited about God's word this morning and what's what he's put on my heart to share with you. And so I want to invite you, maybe forget about what game is on this afternoon or what other activities. Let's just lean in and ask God to speak to us today because I believe he's going to encourage and challenge us. And I've really had a heart in this series that we'd be challenged to just lean in and ask God for his wisdom about our lives. What does he need to teach us? Where does he need to grow us? that he would give us a hunger for, for his word, a hunger for his truth, so that in a world that's following every which way, we would make a, a decision, a line in the sand that, God, I'm going after you, and I want to live the way of the wise. I want to follow your word for my life and for my family. And today, I just want to center my thoughts around this idea, joy, no matter what. Joy, no matter what. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12, read three verses there. But I just want to build on this thought that joy isn't based on my circumstances, but joy is based on Jesus Christ. Let me say it, say it again. Joy isn't based on my circumstances. Joy is based on Jesus Christ. Joy is a word that we're going to hear about all month long. We're going to sing it in songs. It'll be themed and, and, and every store that you go in will hear that word, word joy. And I think so often we mistake joy for a feeling. We mistake joy for an experience or a season or something that we're going through. But I believe God wants to give us joy on the mountaintops, but I believe God can give us joy in the valleys too. And I, I thank you for that one hand clap in the back. I appreciate that. <laughs> A bunch of you are walking through valleys like, nah, I don't got no joy. I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. You weren't with me and my family this week. It was not joy. I, I don't know. Some of you, it sounds like some of you need some joy this morning. It's a good word from God for you. Let me just say it again. Joy isn't based on my circumstances. Joy is based on the fact that Jesus is my Savior that he walks with me, that he brings me strength in my lowest moments. And when I feel depressed and discouraged and alone and weak and like I can't make it through, there is something I can cling to that is greater than my bank account. And it is, it is the power of God living and working inside of me. And I'm thankful for Jesus today. And I pray that God just downloads a, do a dose of joy in your spirit this morning. Hebrews 12 I'm telling you, we could do a whole series on these three verses, but I'm going to try to fit it into about 25 minutes. So let's go. Verse one, it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance Another translation says endurance. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on who? On Jesus. Every line in this passage could be underlined, all right? This is just one of those scriptures. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. I love this thought right here. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Can somebody say amen to God's word? Just love this thought and we're going to build on it because it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the what? The cross. He was able to walk through the most difficult of circumstances because he could see beyond the circumstance to the joy that was set before him. Sometimes the circumstances cloud our minds so much that we can't even see how good God is in the middle of it. The Bible says, though, that Jesus saw beyond the cross to see the freedom that we would find in Christ if he endured it. If, if he persevered through the, the, the worst of situations. A Saturday a week ago, we had a celebration service. 
for a, a sweet lady that we've been praying for for about a year. She, she was battling cancer and just over a week ago, Lynn Helsel went home to be with Jesus. Actually, Don's here this morning. Don, I, I love you and I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you could take to lean in. I just stayed in touch with him the last week or so and we had a beautiful time. There were so many sweet moments of people just celebrating her life and one friend in particular got up and just shared so much about their relationship. I'm telling you, when I think about Lynn, I, I'm always going to think about not so much her life before cancer, but actually I'm going to think about the joy that she had after she was diagnosed with cancer. I haven't known her. They've been coming to our church for maybe just two, two and a half years, three years. And uh, a year ago she was diagnosed and those times in the hospital with her or visiting with her or even seeing her worship here, I'm telling you, there were so many moments where I thought, Lynn, how do you have so much joy? With the difficulty and the diagnosis she was dealing with, I thought, man, this is what real faith looks like. To walk through the most difficult of circumstances, but to still lift your head and say, Jesus, I trust you. I don't know how it's going to work out. And let me tell you, she may not have experienced the healing she prayed for on this earth, but she's experiencing the ultimate healing in heaven. That's what I believe today. She is healed and whole and she is with Jesus. And let me tell you, the enemy, what he wants to do in our life is do everything he can to steal our joy. He wants to steal your joy. And it doesn't take your life being flipped upside down. Sometimes it just takes a flat tire to steal our joy. To, to mess with our system. But three of the things I think about when I read this passage that the enemy wants to do to steal our joy. Number one, it's isolation. You notice what the Hebrew writer says here right at the beginning. He says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. He said, I want to remind you that you're not running a race by yourself. I want, you, I want to remind you that there are people in the grandstands that have gone before you that are watching, that are cheering you on, that are with you every step of the way. You know, there's something different about, about running when you've got somebody with you. Uh, maybe you can't relate to that. I don't know if you're a runner or not, but even this semester we had a running connect group and I found so much joy having people to run with and challenge and push me. There, the, there's so many seasons I think we walk through situations that we find ourselves alone and isolation is one of the enemy's greatest traps in our life. When I'm isolated, I see situations through my perspective. When I'm isolated, I'm susceptible to temptation. When I'm isolated, I tend to focus on my own circumstances. And the enemy, one of his greatest strategies is to make us feel alone. I think it's an important topic even as we step into this Christmas season because while there's so much joy and excitement and events, I find and realize that so many people walk through a season like this feeling empty and alone. The Holy Spirit wants to remind you he's with you. He's your comforter. He's your strength. As a matter of fact, when I think about this idea, I, I, I think about the Christmas tree, everybody. A week ago, Saturday, Jen and the boys, they had gone off to an event. And so I decided to surprise my wife by buying a real Christmas tree. That's right. Yeah, that doesn't, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but we hadn't had a real tree in our house for over 10 years. So I went to the, the, the hardware store, grabbed a tree. I had it all ready. When she got home, I had music on the TV, little jazz music, Christmas jazz. Tree up in the corner. Let me tell you, I scored some points, everybody. Oh my goodness. I, I, got the, I got the tree up. I sat down and, and I watched a couple of, it had been so long since I got a Christmas tree. I had to remind myself, you know, okay, what are all the things I need to do? How do I need to water it? When do I need to water it? And all that. And you, you watch these long videos and at, at the gist of it is you just need to water it, you know, water it every day. And, uh, I, I thought about this week. Actually, I was in the car with, with, with Ben and we were driving and I had this thought to me that no matter how many times I water this tree over the next month, no matter what little chemicals or products, you know, we put in there to keep this tree alive, 
We can water it and water it and water it, but at some point that tree is going to die. And it just disheartened me to think about the money I spent on that tree to know I was <laughs> going to put it by the road in January. Oh. I said, Ben, you know, I think, I think that's oftentimes the way we do. Sometimes we're Christmas tree Christians. Because here's the truth, everybody. It doesn't matter how much you water it. If the tree isn't rooted, it's going to die. And some of us, we mistake being watered for being rooted. All right, right here's the deal. You can water yourself for a while. But at some point, if you do it by yourself, you will get empty and die. That's the way God created us. Even I think about Psalm 92. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. You, you know what the psalmist is saying? He said, if you isolate yourself, you are not going to experience the joy and blessing of following Jesus Christ. That there is fulfillment and there is strength when you lock arms with other believers. Don't stay alone. Listen, the enemy will tell you you'll be fine if you just listen to your worship music and do your own thing. But I'm telling you, it is a trap because God didn't create us to live on islands. He created us to find rooted strength and being connected to one another. And, you know, I even think about that idea of being planted in the house of the Lord and the strength and the joy that we find as a family. It's, it's, it's like my boys, you know, being, being watered is like receiving all the blessing of being in our house. It's like when we walk in the house, if they just went to their rooms, you know, and we cook meals and we just took them to their door and said, all right, guys, here's your meal. Okay, guys, we folded your laundry. The clothes are right outside the door and they just stayed in their room. It's like being watered. But when you're rooted, you're a part of the family. To experience the blessing of being in the family also requires accountability and responsibility. Oh, you're getting quiet on me here, church. Listen. We want to be healthy. We want to be full. And the enemy wants to keep us isolated. But there's joy when we, you know what, we're committed and we belong and we're a part of the family of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. Proverbs 18, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He fights against all sound judgment. I think the other trap is, is comparison. Joy killer. Hebrews 12, 1. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And the truth is that running somebody else's race is exhausting. And I think it's one of the dangerous traps in this season is to look at what everybody else is doing and the busyness and feel like, you know what, we've got to do that to find joy in our life. Hey, you know what? Let's run the race that God has called us to run. Amen. Run the, run, run the race that your family, that God has called your family to run. And then number three, it's opposition. Opposition. Look again at what... The writer says in verse three, he says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Maybe life hasn't been easy for you lately. Let me tell you, life wasn't easy for Jesus either. Maybe you've been dealt some blows or had disappointments or you've had somebody that's just been all over you and against you. Jesus had some people that were against him as well, but he endured. Consider what Jesus walked through and went through and find strength in knowing that you're not alone. Even when you face opposition, there can still be joy in the trials. Can somebody say amen? amen. You, you know what? I, I have a choice, everybody. I can choose joy. I can declare that no matter what I'm walking through, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. This week we were up in Pensacola with Jen's sister. We had, a, we had a great time. And Friday morning, we went into downtown Pensacola. And it's been years since I've been in that area. And we, we had a great time with family. And we took, took a walk through the city, had lunch together, and then we got on the road. And we hadn't been on the road heading home about 10 minutes when one of my boys, who will remain unnamed, but it wasn't Caden, it was the other one, all right? <laughs> 
<laughs> said, Dad, I need to go to the bathroom. What is it about our bladders that when we get on a road trip, they just get like in hyper mode, right? Right? It's like you just get on a trip. Oh, we need to stop. And I got a little frustrated in that moment. I said, but we just got on the highway. Like we're, we're not stopping. Grab a cup. I, you know, there's something. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, hold it. <laughs> and, uh, I was determined, we're, like, we're, we're, we're not stopping. And about five minutes later, we, Jen looked up and she saw a rest area sign and she said, Wes, let's stop. Why don't we, we, truth is, we all just needed to take a stop and go to the restroom. And we got out of the car. We smelled something funny, didn't think too much about it. We all went to the restroom. We were making our way back out to the vehicle. A guy was passing me. He said, is that your, is that your car out there? He said, there's smoke coming out from under the hood. We hadn't had any issues with our car the whole trip. And we walk out and I lift up the, the, the hood of the engine and there is smoke coming out everywhere. I look behind the, the cylinders and there's oil. I don't know anything about cars, everybody, but I saw oil where there wasn't supposed to be oil. I call my brother-in-law, he makes his way there. I tried uh, mechanic after mechanic and I was just getting nothing. It's, it's you know, Friday, it's a holiday, nobody's open. He gets there, we're looking at everything. I'm, we're scrambling, like, I don't know what to do. Finally, we get a hold of somebody. We get our vehicle to the mechanic. He's calling around. Finally, he gets a hold of the part. He says, you got this. He could have told me the whole engine was blown and I wouldn't have known any better, but he was an honest mechanic and he helped get fixed what needed to be fixed, some kind of gasket, uh, oil gasket, and got it replaced Long story short is we didn't get back on the road till about 4.30 and made it home just before midnight on Friday. It was a long day Friday. But can I tell you, we drove home with so much gratitude on Friday night, thanking God for that rest stop on I-10. Here's the truth, everybody. I, I thought through in my mind so many times, I could have been stubborn and kept driving and I could have I could have put my family in harm's way. But thank God my son had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> thank God my wife said, Wes, stop. Because that detour could have helped save us. Some of you are looking at the detours of your life, the disappointments, the denials, the discouragement, and you're saying, woe is me, why God? And I wonder, could I propose to you that maybe the detour is actually part of your destiny? Maybe God allowed that detour to happen because if you would have kept going at the pace you were going, you could have caught on fire. You, you could have blown your engine. You could have found yourself in a place you shouldn't have been in. But God said, you know what? I need them to make a stop because there's something I need to show them. And if I can't get their attention, they're going to they're gonna run themselves into the ground. Listen, sometimes we need to find joy even in the detours of our life. All right. I don't, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody is walking through a detour in this room or online right now. You're facing a difficulty, a setback, and it feels overwhelming. And why don't you just allow the joy of the Holy Spirit to step into your situation and see your situation through a different perspective today. God is faithful and God is good. You know, I, I have the choice. I can despise the difficulties or I can choose joy. And I'm gonna just challenge us as a church. Why don't we choose joy today? I choose joy. God, you are faithful. You are good. And I thank you for every circumstance in my life. Let me, let me just give us three declarations and then we can go this morning just around this idea, joy, no matter what. And I pray that these will just encourage and strengthen you as we start our week together. Number one, I think we need to make this declaration that negative is not my normal. Negative is not my normal. And if you'll just excuse me for the next few minutes, I'm going to preach to myself. And if you want to listen along, you can. Because I, I realize this about myself is that there is a tendency in my heart to be pessimistic, to be doubtful, 
to get angry, to get upset, to have a negative mindset about the situations. I'll just be honest with you. I'm human. I'm human. You have this tendency about you too. And I have to work daily to train my thought life to believe the best about what I'm going through. And I have to make a decision every time I put my feet to the ground and get out of bed that negative is not going to be the normal in my life. I'm going to believe the best. I am going to choose joy. You know, I think about that story of the prodigal son, Luke 15. We, sh we talk about it so often. I think so, so much effort is put and focus is put uh, on the son that ran away. The one that took his inheritance, remember, and squandered it all. And he lived with the pigs and he reached the lowest place of his life until he looked up and said, God, I need you. And came back home to his father. But I think it's interesting because Jesus doesn't just tell a story about one brother. He, he tells a story about two brothers. And at the end of the story, after the, the, the reuniting of the father and son, you see this interaction between the father and the, and the boy that stayed home, it says this in, in verse 28, it says the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could, can you just imagine this guy? I mean, he's just out there just complaining, just miserable, unhappy. You never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. In verse 31, listen to what the father said. My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Notice this brother, he's, he's at peace at home. He's walking and living in the blessing and safety and comfort. But all he can experience is the negativity in his heart because of what his brother is getting and he's not. You know, some of us are the prodigal son, but the truth is, is that some of us, we're the, we're the other brother. We're at home, but we're not happy. We've got it going good in our lives, but all we can do is look out and see what everybody else is getting, the blessing in their life, the new car they're driving, that new house, all the good things. Oh, look, they're so happy. Look at their Christmas pictures. The truth is God has blessed you and there's so much joy in your life, but we get so messed up by looking out at everybody else. Why don't we make a decision that negative is not our normal? We're not going to base our joy on anybody else's circumstance, but what God is doing in our life. Can somebody say amen? amen. Negative is not my normal. Number two, we got to make this declaration is that my purpose is greater than my pain. I don't know what that was, but it's painful. Yeah, it's painful. My purpose is greater than my pain. When the pain has purpose, we find a way to endure. We do. When the pain has purpose, we find a way to endure. Just think about it like this, is that oftentimes, you know, if going to the gym, you'll, you'll pick up dumbbells and you'll lift weights and bench press and you find purpose in it. I, I find purpose. I have no problem with it. I know it's making me healthy and I enjoy doing it. But then when my wife asked me to load all the suitcases in the car. No, no. That's what we got a 12 and 13 year old kid for. <laughs> Wes, will you go? Will you go load the suitcases? Yes, I will. Caden and Ben, would you come here real quick? <laughs> And the truth is that when we find purpose in what we're going through, we'll find the, the ability to endure. Some, some of you right now are walking through painful situations and the enemy has used it to zap your joy, to steal your joy, to rob you of the good things in your life. 
And I would just encourage you and, and I'd pastor you for a minute today and say, why don't you just step back and in the middle of your heartache, in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of your health situation, would you just look around and say, thank you, Jesus, because you've been faithful to my family. Thank you, Jesus, that it's been a struggle, but God, you are good. And I will choose to walk in joy today. I will choose to walk in joy. I, I will find purpose in my pain because maybe there's something that you're showing me that you couldn't show me any other way. My purpose is greater than my pain. Negative is not my normal. And number three, Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my joy. Paul says this in Philippians chapter three, and I'll invite the worship team and band, if you would make your way back. He says this, but all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. Yes, everything else is worthless, when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul is, he's sitting in a prison cell. He has nothing. He has nothing, yet he has everything. You know, I think one of the dangerous things for us in our American culture is that because we have everything, we forget how much we need Jesus. Sometimes we don't realize how much we need Jesus until he's all we have. And I can just imagine Paul in this moment realizing, I don't have anything else. I don't have possessions. I, I, don't, I don't have money. I, I can't go anywhere. I don't even have my freedom, but I have Jesus. And as long as I have Jesus, I have everything. Jesus is my joy. I, I, I wanna invite you today. Can we just take a mind shift and just make this declaration over, over our lives that no matter what happens this week, no matter what happens this month, no matter what setbacks or heartaches we walk through, that if we stay with Jesus, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay. Some of you right now, maybe you've been walking through a season where you've been trying to do things in your own strength. But today's a day of surrender to say, Jesus, it's just led me to emptiness and I wanna choose you because I believe that you bring joy and peace to my life. You're all I need. That's the way of the wise is to choose joy, to choose Jesus. And I believe when we do, he will, in those lonely moments, in those empty moments, he'll speak peace into our spirit and remind us you're not alone. I love you, I'm with you and I'm gonna see you through every situation. If you believe it, would you say amen? And then watch you bow your heads this morning. Negative is not my normal. My purpose is greater than my pain in Jesus. You are my joy. Jesus, we want to stop this morning. We just want to say thank you for the detours. Thank you for the detours, God. Lord, thank you for saving us from ourselves because if we had gone our own way, who knows where we would be, but the grace and mercy of Jesus brought us back home. Why don't you just right now begin to open your heart to God and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me for saving me, for redeeming me. All across this room, maybe you're here, you just, you need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, why don't you just slip your hand up right now and say, that's me. Jesus, save me, forgive me, restore me. God bless you, God bless you. Let me just ask this right now. Maybe you've just been in an empty place and you just need to experience the joy of the Lord that is your strength. You've been walking through a season where you're dealing with anxiety or depression. You feel alone or empty. And today you just, that's me. I need, I need joy. Why don't you just lift your hand right now and say, Jesus, give me your joy. Give me your joy. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.
If you're saying yes to Christ, just say a simple prayer like this. This is dear Jesus, come in my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. Today I choose to serve you and follow you all my days. I repent, I repent, I turn back and I turn to you. And I ask you to heal me, forgive me and save me. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love your presence. We thank you that even when we can't see it, you're working. And that in the highs and lows of life, God, we, we make the decision that we're gonna, we're gonna walk in joy no matter what. Joy no matter what. We worship you today. Hey, I just wanna invite you right now. Why don't you just stand? Let's just open our hearts to Jesus. Yeah. 